Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who hath the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley, and in this video I'm continuing the series on the Apostles' Creed. In the last video I said that, uh, because the last video was going a little longer than I wanted it to, that I'd talk more about the humanity of Christ, that side of the Incarnation, in a separate video. This is that separate video. The Creed says that Jesus, he was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered for us under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. And in this video I want to talk about the humanity of Christ, what one, what many writers have spoken of as the sacred humanity of the Redeemer. And what that means is simply the point, Jesus is fully human. It's something that I think evangelicals have too often forgotten. Why is that? Well, very often, and I think very much, it's because the early years of evangelicalism, the formative years of evangelicalism, evangelicals were battling against liberals who denied the human, who denied not the humanity, but the deity of Christ. The liberal says Jesus is only a man. So it's to use a technical term, it's a humanitarian view of Jesus. The problem with a purely humanitarian view of Jesus is it doesn't do justice to what the Bible says. It means that you've somehow got to explain away what happens when Thomas, at the climax of the Gospel according to John, and he falls on his knees and says, My Lord and my God. Now if you say Jesus is only a man, how do you explain that? Well, you find it very difficult and you end up having to explain it away and say, Well, there's, there's the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And so evangelicals were fighting against this purely humanitarian view of Jesus. The problem is that that leads certainly fundamentalism, which I would define as certainly the way fundamentalism develops. I mean, I'm not talking about the authors of the fundamentals. Many of them were very intelligent, very well educated, very capable theologians. I think of someone like James Orr in Scotland, who is perhaps the first writer in English to use the term worldview and to introduce the idea of a worldview into English theological writing. He's a, a very, very capable man, very, very intelligent. But later, particularly American fundamentalism, tends to be a kind of anti-intellectualism anti to it. And that means that all too often you get these rather unsophisticated ideas which lead to the idea, and some people are like this, uh, A.B. A. Bruce was like this. They find it very difficult to entertain more than one thought in the head at any one time. And the result is that you can get this rather unbalanced treatment. And evangelicals at times have been guilty of under-emphasising the humanity of Christ because they've been so engaged in defending his, human his divinity. But when we look back at the history of the church, we find that the earliest debates, the earliest disputes in Christianity about Jesus were not disputes about his deity. They come later, and initially they are, what does it mean to say Jesus is God? But in terms of the earliest debates about Jesus, they're about his humanity. The Gnostics don't like the idea of a fully human Jesus. Later on, history goes on, you have arguments between those who, who emphasise the deity of Christ to the point of imperiling the humanity, and those who emphasise the humanity to the point of imperiling the deity. You have what's called the Nestorian debate. Now, there is a very real possibility that Nestorius was not a Nestorian, but what Nestorianism is, is it's the idea that the Incarnation isn't a real Incarnation, it's that you have a man, Jesus, who is very, very closely associated with the Divine Christ, but 
they are two persons. So that the, the human and the divine can have a conversation between each other. Um, now this is quite clearly not true. The question is, did Nestorius teach this? We, it depends who you listen to. Um, but the one of the responses to this is something that is called Apollinarianism. Apollinaris was a man who came from Alexandria, Egypt, and he taught that in the Incarnation what happened was that the divine nature of Christ took the place of the human spirit. In other words, that you have a, a human body, but not a true spiritual side of the humanity. Now, Apollinaire seemed initially to have taken the, uh, the biblical position, as I see it, which is that hum human beings consist of two parts, a physical part, the body, and a spiritual part, the soul or spirit. But he then seems to have got into a trichotomous position, there are three parts, and the, the divine nature takes the part of the human spirit. But either way, what he's saying is that Jesus' humanity is not a full humanity. So we have this point that the humanity of Christ is threatened by certain, and it, a lot of it's philosophy, it's the idea that we need to be able to, to fully comprehend things. I always like what old Joseph Hart says about the Incarnation. He says, how it was done we can't discuss, but this we know, it was done for us. That's a very practical and sensible approach. Look, we, we don't understand the mechanism of the Incarnation. The question is, does the Bible say Jesus is God? Yes. Does the Bible say he's a man? Yes. Which is true? Yes. They're both true. Fully man and fully God. That is the, the orthodox confession. That's what the creed is confessing. But the incarnation means a true humanity. He was born. And birth is very important. Because that's how human beings come into the world. If we ha have a human being who pops into existence at the age of 30, that's only happened once. It may even be earlier than that. But the point is Adam and Eve are created as fully functioning adults. Now they're expected to be able to procreate as soon as they're created. They're made as adults. But that is the beginning of the human race. And every human derived from Adam and Eve is born into the world. Jesus is born. And he's born of the Virgin Mary. It's a miraculous birth. It is the, the great miraculous birth that all the other miraculous births in Scripture. You, know, you think of Isaac, for example. You think of John the Baptist. You think of... Uh, Samson, and you can look at all these various miraculous births in Scripture, and, and all of them are pointing to Jesus, and he is the ultimate miraculous birth, because he is the case, in all the other cases, it's couples who can't have children have miraculous fertility treatment, if you will. But Jesus is born of a virgin, born of a woman who has never known a man, and it is a real birth. We we sentimentalise it in Christmas cards. Let's be honest. Christmas carols often sentimentalise it. We're talking about a woman giving birth. It's messy. It's difficult because childbirth is messy and difficult. It's also a wonderful thing. He was born. He grew up. We, we're given very little information about the early years of Jesus in the Gospels. They, they draw a veil over these things. I do wonder, is this not a, a useful point to make, that children should be allowed to grow up in private, should not be brought before the world. I, I, I worry when I see the children of politicians, when I see the um, young princes and princesses, and the way that they are treated when they are so very young. It's, it's not healthy. It's not a healthy thing to do with children. But that's, I think, a something that you can derive at least from the Gospels when they're dealing with Jesus. But he, he grew up. He grew up. The child grew up. 
we find Luke says, for example, Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. His development was a real development. He really grew up. He was a real child. We see him in Luke chapter 2, that one little glimpse in the childhood when we have young Jesus going up to Jerusalem for the first time. And he's sitting in the temple. He's not teaching in the temple. That's a, a mythological accretion that comes in the Middle Ages. No, he's sitting learning because he's a, he's a boy. He's a, a little boy. He's a child. The position of a child is to be learning, not to be teaching. The so-called infancy gospels, the childhood gospels, are grotesque stories. The infancy gospel of Thomas, for example, because... Whoever wrote them didn't understand, or the various authors didn't understand that the infant Jesus is a real is a real child, that little boy Jesus is a real little boy. And I you know, we we have the, the veil drawn over his childhood, but he was I think a very normal childhood. He was a normal child, yet without sin. But he was a normal, healthy child. He grew up. Is not this the carpenter, they said. He had a period when he was working. He dignifies work by his work. He's a real man, a man there is. A real man. And that real humanity was always in union with the real divinity. In him, the Apostle Paul says, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now that would have been offensive to the Gnostics, that the fullness of deity, that which makes God God, dwells bodily in a man, because the body or the flesh, these are things, you know, the word was made flesh. If you want to really, really rile a dualist, someone who believes that flesh bad, spirit, good, then that's one of the ways to do it. You say, well, the word became flesh. Oh, flesh, flesh bad. No, flesh is good because God made flesh. The resurrection of the flesh is real. And the, the denial of, a true, of the true humanity of Christ in terms of his uh, really being a man, leads to a rather unsympathetic understanding. How can he understand, how can he sympathise with us if he is not a man? You know, one, one thinks and one is loath to use pop culture illustrations, but I think this is a good one. It's, you know, it's Superman. You know, it, it, he's been around since the 1930s, so most of you have heard. Because the whole point about Superman is he's an alien from the planet Krypton, who's living on Earth, and he's pretending to be a human being. But he's invulnerable, his body, when he's shot, he's not hurt. If you, he's punched in the jaw, then it breaks the person punching him, the fist. And yet at the same time he has to pretend to be Clark Kent. But it's pretending, he's pretending to be human. Jesus is not pretending to be human. Jesus is human. He's more than human, but he's not less than human. He is a, a man, a real man. We see him in the Gospels. We see him hungry. We see him weeping. We see him thirsty. We see him weary. It amazes me, uh, old Dan Brown in his book, The Da Vinci Code, says of the yeah, selection of the Gospels, basically all the claim, historical claims in that book are fiction. It's all fiction from beginning to end, even the bits that Dan Brown likes to suggest aren't fiction, but it's another matter. Um, but he says, suggests that what happened is that at the Council of Nicaea, they decided which Gospels to keep. And this is a, it's a, it's a myth that comes to being hundreds of years after Nicaea. But he says, well, they, they decided to keep those that emphasise the deity and not the humanity. I'm paraphrasing. Well, the reality is that if you look at the so-called Gnostic Gospels and you look at the, the four Gospels, you find it's the other way around. The, the books that are in the Bible are 
the books that speak of the humanity of Christ. He's born, he dies, he's weary, he's hungry, he's thirsty. The so-called Gnostic Gospels present someone who's not fully human because the people who wrote them didn't think that he could be fully human. And what that means, you get a very unsympathetic Jesus. This is something that leads to problems in people's theology. If you've got a situation where you're confessing, we believe that Jesus is fully man, but actually what you're doing is you're emphasising his deity and not talking about the humanity. What you end up with is the idea of Jesus, the stern divine judge. And you, you have to look for your humanity elsewhere. That's one of the places where the the veneration of the Virgin Mary comes from. Because Mary's a mother. Mary's human. Mary's sympathetic. You can find this again in, in some of these fundamentalist churches that don't sufficiently talk about the humanity as well as the divinity of Christ. That you have this very unsympathetic theology, this theology that doesn't feel for men's weaknesses, for people's weaknesses, but that leaves us with the idea that sin committed after baptism, well, we're not sure it can even be forgiven. And that's a very difficult thing. It's one of the reasons why we have to emphasise Jesus is fully, fully man as well as fully God. He is true man and true God. God with us, Emmanuel. And he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That his, the physical sufferings are real. Now the Gospels very much draw a veil over those things. We see them brought out more in particularly Isaiah 53. He was wounded, he suffered. But he, he suffered in his body, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He was crucified. And this is not an embarrassment. And he died. A true human nature can die. Jesus died. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. See, this is where the incarnation is so vital. And a Christianity that forgets the incarnation loses so much. Or oh, let us then speak of the wonder, the marvel of God crucified for sinners. Yes, God crucified. Uh, God willing, the next video I'll go more into that, that point of God crucified. But my God was crucified for me. Well, thank you for watching. May God help us all to more fully and wonderfully recognise the love of God. Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching.